I'd like to introduce uh, Vincent Larivière. Uh, so I've met Vincent like a year ago, maybe yeah, a bit, a bit less than that. Uh, he's uh, extremely impressive for the energy that he brings to the uh, the scholarly communication uh, field, uh, and uh, he doesn't want to, me to list all the titles, but just the uh, so just to know that he, you have to know that he is a professor at the University of Montreal. He's also the Canadian chair for the uh, transformation of uh, co uh, scholarly communication, mm -hmm. and also the uh, scientific director of uh, Erudit, which is a uh, Quebec, uh, Quebec uh, based uh, publishing platform. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's it. But if you look on the web, you'll see that he does many other things as well. And I'm sure he will wake up those who are st starting to be a bit uh, tired of the, uh, those two uh, very busy days. Uh, thank, thank you. I'm going to steal your mic because I'm going <laughs> to. Thanks, uh, Jean Baptiste, for the introduction. Can you hear me? Does that work? Yeah, OK. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks a lot for staying. I know it's been two busy days, so I'm very happy to be here, very happy to present quite a lot of empirical results, actually, on, on some of the factors that affect the researchers' uh, open access uh, publishing practices. And this is a research project that is uh, done with my colleague uh, Cassidy Sugimoto at uh, Indiana University. So a bit of a background. So I'm going to kind of go to why, why is OA important, what are kind of the um, incentives or advantages for researchers in the research system to disseminate their research results in open access. Then, given that it's again an empirical piece, I'm going to talk a bit about the data sources and how are we actually able to measure some of these uh, aspects. And then maybe a bit of a reminding you of the various flavors of, of open access that exists down there. And then, of course, there's plenty of factors that can uh, affect open access. And we're going to look at three. Um, the most important that we're going to look into are the open access mandates from uh, research councils. And I've got good and bad news uh, to present you here. But actually, I have good news, which is not something quite unusual um, in our world. So, uh, and then we're going to look at the gender gap and in open access dissemination. There's a lot of debates on diversity in academe and on the gender gap in the production and, and scientific impact. We're going to look at, is there a gender gap in disseminating in, in open access? And then I'm going to revisit a study that has been published in 2009 by Science. Um, about the, uh, the fact that developing countries were actually citing more open access research. And now that we have good data to test that, I actually have bad news again. So we're going to conclude on the bad news, unfortunately. And then I'm going to conclude by a few implications. Um, and given that I actually hate constraints, I will probably walk back and forth with a mic. So I apologize for those that are at the end of the room when I'm there. And I'm going to try to be equal in my walking on each side. OK. So why is OA? Uh, considered as an open or as a success indicator in general. And this is a slide from Ashton University Library Sources that, that tries to kind of convince its researchers that this is something important. So of course, for researchers, it's considered as a way of disseminating that leads to increased visibility. Um, and then kind of the direct link with that, which is more on the incentive side, it's also led in many studies to uh, increase citation rates. Uh, it can be considered as driving innovation. And th that's, again, the science study that I, that I mentioned earlier as having a global impact, because the countries are, that are unable to pay subscription fees, of course, would theoretically rely more on uh, open access literature. It also leads to um, more public access, so general, the general public, which of course doesn't have a university affiliation and then doesn't have access to the research, uh, can have access to, to what's being published. And then, of course, and this is where there's a little check mark, that they can comply with the funders' policy who are increasingly asking for, uh, for researchers to disseminate uh, through open access uh, means. So a few, a bit of a reminder to all of you guys of various routes that exist when it comes to uh, open access. Of course, so non-subscription journals uh, also have a, uh, typically would have a APCs and then that would lead to gold uh, open access. Then, but then also there's the world of the hybrid journals uh, where there's both uh, the hybrid way and then the, uh, the self-archiving way. And then it leads to two different global flavor. And I will not go into the browns, uh, which is kind of gold with, uh, without a license that, that could be, be found. But basically, two general flavors. The gold, which is a final version that is available freely online. And then the green, which is basically uh, self-archiving. And we're going to look at kind of the two dimensions of that in the, in, in the results. So. Until a few years, it was actually very difficult to measure uh, open access. So in the early days of Google Scholar, there was kind of an API, or there was at least ways 
for scholars to mine Google Scholar to kind of assess the proportion of papers from a given institution that were available in open access. And now, well, that has been shut for quite a while and took a few years for the community to develop these uh, open access mi miners like uh, open access button. And of course, on paywall, which is going to be uh, at the heart of what I will be uh, presenting. And so that kind of new generation of open tools allows to measure open access and open access compliance in, in, in the case of what I'll be talking about um, in a much better way than we used to. So we don't have to rely necessarily on small samples that we would manually check, but there's comprehensive data sets that allow us to, um, to do that. So a few words on Unpaywa. I don't know if Jason and Heather are there. Yeah, okay, now I'm stressed. So, <laughs> so you need to tell me what, I, what I'm saying is right. So basically, at the heart of Unpaywall, there's the Crossref metadata, uh, which basically gives the population of all of the scholarly papers that are out there. So on the data dump that we got from uh, April to uh, 2019, we had about 95 million uh, DOIs. And then from the DOIs, there's the mining of about 50,000 sources to find whether the document is available on open access. And so, of course, there's the DOAJ, which kind of gives the basis of open access journal, which means that all of their content is available freely. But then there's the, mine, the, the mining of plenty of rep repositories that go from institutional repositories to disciplinary repositories, et cetera. So we're now able to have the status of open access of a given document. And when a given document is, pre is present in many ways, so let's say that the document is both self-archived on a, an institutional repository, but also published in a gold open access journal, then the two versions will be uh, available in the system. Also, there's going to be a flag for each of them. And we see that there's quite a lot of document who end up being in both uh, green and, and gold, uh, gold open access. And of course, one thing that is crucial is that in the unpaywall data, all of the um, ResearchGate and SciHub and Academia-based uh, accesses are not covered. So it's always considered, let's say, as legal um, legal and open access. So, so with the unpaywall data, um, Jason and Heather have already led a, a study um, that shows many things. But one of them is that open access was on the right, that it was actually feasible to measure the growth of that, and that the data was relatively robust. I'm going to start my walking a bit now. Uh, so basically, you clearly see that. Starting 1990, a clear upward trend in the number of open access papers that are be being published. And globally, we're at about 50% of papers that are available through open access. And m most of them actually being in that kind of uh, bronze category, which is basically, as I said, papers for which the final version is available on the journal website, but for which there's no license that could be found. So these are papers that we don't know whether they will actually remain in, uh, in open access. So it's both, and it both makes me happy and sad, or it's something that is, can make you enthusiastic, but a bit frightened in the sense that this can or may disappear in terms of their access at, uh, at some point. Um, but then the unpaywall data does not have all of the of the metadata that we would need to do more advanced, uh, more, more advanced analysis. So in most of the slides that I will present you, we've actually merged that with the Web of Science data, which has much more metadata on the SCARI document. But then, of course, it restricts the sample to the Web of Science data, which, of course, has all of the limitations that we know about, which is the non-complete coverage of all disciplines, but mostly of the social sciences and humanities, as well as a lot of research from, um, from the Global South. Now moving to mandates. So what we've been seeing is that mandates are increasing. Uh, there's more and more mandates by funders, by institutions, uh, by various research organizations. Um, since 2015, the trend seems to be maybe, maybe slightly less enthusiasm around mandates. There's a bit of a flattening of the, uh, uh, of the curve, but still, it, it's still increasing. Um, but we actually know very little on compliance with these mandates. Um, mostly, again, because we didn't have data to assess that, uh, access, assess that properly. So in the old um, Google Scholar day, I would say, uh, my colleague Yassine Gargouri did a small study looking at whether mandated institution, this was in the, in the aftermath, let's say, of the Finch report, where basically he wanted to test whether these mandates work. So that self-archiving, in a way, was, w w was working too. Um, and so what we saw with that analysis is that basically papers from mandated institution had much more higher open access rates than from non-mandated institution. But this was based 
on a relatively small uh, sample of mandates because, of course, of the means that were existing at the time where we could not do uh, more comprehensive um, analysis. And so, of course, in the system right now, there's two types of mandates, those from institutions and those from, uh, from research councils. Um, one of the mandates that is the most well-known is the one from the Université de Liège in Belgium, which I suppose most of you guys are aware of. And that mandate is very, very simple. What's going to be used in the faculty evaluation are the documents that are in the institutional repository, period. So that means that faculty deposit, because that's the means through which they're going to be evaluated. So it's, it's not, you could say that it's a very small constraint, but in reality, it's a very big constraint because all of your faculty trajectory is based on what you're going to put um, in, the, uh, in the institutional repository. So that's kind of their levers. In the case of uh, funders' open access mandates, it's typically more restrictive. It's considered a bit like a contractual uh, agreement that you have with the funder. Um, but as we'll see later, there's not so much... Uh, there's not that many cases of researchers that have been uh, that, 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 that have had their, their fin funding withhold, let's say, uh, if they did not comply. So, but again, that's the lever that, that they can use. And of course, given what has been said yesterday about the, the plan that we cannot mention the word of, uh, so basically Plan S, which, uh, which is, let's say, slightly controversial, where basically European funders um, are, are let's say, pushing for OA in a, in a tougher manner than, than they used to, where basically researchers that are funded will have to publish in open access journals. Um, but that, again, is something that we cannot measure yet, but that with the tools that are being developed right now that we'll be able to measure in the near future. So very quickly, um, mandates have several characteristics in terms of the deposit of scholarly documents. So some mandates will actually require you to deposit the document or to deposit a paper. Some others will say, well, we we hope that you're going to deposit it, but we don't actually require it. So those are a bit softer. Um, some mandates allow for an embargo period, both in terms of either deposit or access. Some others say, no, it has to be deposited on the moment where the paper is published. Some ask you to deposit in a specific repository, while others will say, you can deposit any place you want as long as it's open access. Then there's always the case of dark versus open uh, access, which, where in the case of dark, there's a copy that's, a, that's on the institution server, but it's not available to the community. And then there's the issue of the copyright. Who keeps the copyright? Is it the researcher? Is it, do we still grant it to the journal? And then the always very uh, well discussed opting out mechanism. Do you actually have to comply or you can actually uh, opt out. So the, the, fu the funders that we analyzed kind of have mandates that go throughout this spectrum. So um, we analyzed 12 funders um, from basically four countries, um, three fr funders from the United States, three funders from Canada, uh, five funders from uh, the United Kingdom, and then one funder for, uh, for Europe, which all have, again, different uh, structures and different uh, effective policy dates. So of course, the, the oldest that we have there are from MRC, from uh, ESRC and IH that are, like say, in the early days. And then we've got a bit more recent mandates with the Gates Foundation and um, and, and, and CERC and, and, and SHRC at the, at, the, at the Canadian level. So we've got two, 12 mandates that basically cover all disciplines and cover different strengths and, and weaknesses. So how did we compile compliance? So as I said earlier, we link the Web of Science data with the unpaywall data to basically use the strength of the, both databases. So in the Web of Science data, you actually have funding acknowledgement information. So we're actually able to know whether that paper is considered to be funded by, uh, by one of the research councils. And so, uh, so we're actually able to look at, for each of the funders, whether their papers uh, were, were actually available through, uh, through OA. So, Again, the funders vary quite a lot in their, um, in their size. Uh, NSF with uh, about 260,000 funded papers over the, the, the period studied, while on the other, at the other end of the spectrum, we have the tiny, tiny SHRC uh, Council in Canada that funds social sciences and humanities that has much less uh, funded papers. So how do the results look like? Well, it depends where you're from. So as a, someone who holds a Canadian passport, there's nothing to be very happy with uh, in terms of those, those results. So 
If you look at, the, at your top left, you've got all of the data for the United States, and you see that basically NIH has crazy high levels of compliance until the last year, where basically embargo period kicks in, because there's a 12-month embargo at NIH, and this is actually being used by publishers. So there's really a big difference in the general as uh, open access rates of scholarly papers that are one year older versus those that are basically on, on the same year. But compliance globally work. These are relatively positive results for NIH. The way the NIH mandate is structured works with researchers. At the other end of the US spectrum, you have NSF, which funds a similar number of papers than NIH, but where basically compliance is observed only in 50% of the cases. Um, for many reasons. One of them is the fact that NIH has a dedicated infrastructure. So basically at the NIH, your paper has to end up in PubMed Central, and there's no embargo in deposit. So as early as the paper is published, poof, there needs to be a copy in PubMed Central, and they're gonna take care of managing the embargo period. Um, and that seems to make a big difference. Basically, if there's an embargo on deposit, you say, okay, I'm gonna deposit later, in the end, you never deposit. Well, if you have to do it now, then you do it, and basically the institutions that are around you, the structure, take care of making the paper open. For the United Kingdom, we see that compliance rates or rates of open access have increased sizably post-2012. So in 2012, there was a publication of a report by, which is called the Finch Report, that basically um, suggested to go the gold route. So we need to go to open access, and this has to be done mostly through APCs, funding journals, et cetera. And globally, indeed, it has led to much higher open access rate. We'll see later whether it led to more green or gold. But globally, it seemed to have also worked. But again, for all of the countries, there's a big difference between social sciences and humanities and medical sciences, where basically open access rates are higher in medicine than in uh, social sciences and humanities. Now we move to the Canadian case. Um, so CIHR was one of the first councils to, uh, cr to have an open access mandate. It's a very old mandate, but it has never worked. So basically, compliance rates are about half those of NIH. Why? Because there's no dedicated infrastructure, and there has never been any coercitive measures. So yeah, you need to comply. You don't comply. We don't check. So researchers did not really um, spend energy uh, on that. And in the case of NSERC and social and, and SHRC, which cover natural sciences and social sciences and humanities, is actually, again, very low uh, with uh, open access rates that are way below uh, world averages. So this is actually quite bad news. Um, in the case of ERC, we see that it's increasing and it's above the general trend for the European Union. So again, we're far from being at 100%, but again, given that the, that the mandate is relatively young, we need to give time to time, as they say, so that uh, compliance rises. Now, in terms of green versus gold um, open access, so what you have here, um, on the top, you've got papers that are only available through gold away. At the bottom, you've got those that are available through green, and in the middle, is paper that are both available in, in, in green and gold. And we see that NIH has the highest proportion of green, again, because of PubMed Central, because of the fact that there's a green infrastructure that allows for the dissemination of, uh, of papers. But for most of the councils, um, it's either papers that are both green and gold um, or that are uh, only available into, uh, into gold. At the level of the UK and, and, and Europe, but mo mostly UK here, what you see again is the strong effect of the Finch report, where basically um, green is either stable or, or decreasing in some cases, uh, and the op and open access, the growth of open access, is almost exclusively due to growth in, um, in gold away, so we're basically in APC, so of course there's a cost uh, to, to that. Um, and of course, there's a cost to that that varies sizably um, by, by publisher. So, of course, um, peer J plus one that are 1,000, 1,500. And, uh, and as you move towards um, journals that have either higher reputation or higher impact factor or that are owned by for-profit publishers, of course, the prices uh, increase. And so, of course, going the gold route has some financial implications. 
And I was in, uh, in Brazil last week, and basically uh, for celebrating the Cielo 20th anniversary, that was actually two, year, two weeks ago, um, with their APCs of 500. So again, this is way uh, lower than what most publishers charge for. Now, one thing that we hear a lot when we talk about open access is the fact that, oh, well, you know, my discipline is different. So I know that physicists do it, but I'm a chemist, so it's not possible for me as a chemist to do that because, well, you know. Uh, and so what we try to do here is to look at, let's say that you're a chemist, but that you're funded by NIH. Do you comply or you actually fight it? No, you comply. So again, the funder's mandate kind of are stronger, let's say, than the disciplinary culture that we, that, that we observe. Um, and, uh, and you even see it for, for shirks. So in the case of the social sciences, uh, and actually, where, where is it? Yeah, okay, no, let's look at chemistry, which is, um, yeah, chemistry on the top, on your top left. So basically, when chemistry is funded by NIH, uh, by, by NSF, compliance is at 24%. When chemistry is funded by NIH, it's at 81%. I know I have no mic, but uh, I forgot. So basically, chemistry funded by NIH, it works. Chemistry funded by NSF, it doesn't work. So really, again, the funders are stronger than the disciplinary culture, and they can actually change the behaviors of scholars. So to conclude on, um, on open access mandates, one key thing is to have a dedicated infrastructure. If there's no dedicated infrastructure, the mandates don't work as well. The issue of embargo, if there's an embargo on deposit, people don't deposit. They need to deposit as early as the paper is accepted, and then the infrastructure takes care of giving access. Then the disciplinary culture can be changed with the right incentives. And of course, the question of APC remains, uh, remains quite important, because if, we, if funders decide to go the gold route, then there's money um, that might not be spent wisely, in my opinion. Then, we, we, we did a little table here, which may, may, may be a bit small for you guys um, to look at, but we looked at all of the various policies and took out what was the financial support that was provided by the, the funders for OA and also the sanctions for non-compliance. What do they write in their policy documents about those that will not comply to the OA policy? Um, if you take the Canadian funders, um, it's considered, for instance, as a breach of the ethics, um, the kind of the ethics agreement that you have with the funder. But then in the case of ethics, typically you need a whistleblower. So um, given that there won't probably any be whistleblowers tell the, the center that you didn't, the, the funder that you did not uh, deposit, the uh, potential section are, are probably very weak. Now, most of the mandate that work well are uh, cases where there's a potential loss of funding, or there's a suppression uh, or, or a suspension of the award processing. So again, what works is things that are related with money. If you lose your award, then of course uh, you will comply. So that concludes the mandate thing. I still have, I think, a bit of time to talk about the gender gap. So the other factor that I wanted to uh, present is gender, which, is, which has been at the heart of what I've been working on and that many people, I think, are trying right now understanding that is important. Um, and so we know that there's a gender gap in scholarly output. So that, that, that map basically shows that the, the, the bluer the country, the higher the proportion of papers being written by men. And the more orange the country, the higher the proportion of female uh, authors in that country. And so you see that there's a few orange countries huh, where, uh, where, where female authors are actually more present than male authors. Uh, in a few of those cases, it's not so much for good reason. So um, in the case of, uh, I think it's Latvia, um, the, ga the, the, the positive gap in favor of women is mostly due to the fact that the life expectancy of men is about 12 years younger uh, th than female. So of course, men die younger, and that, leads, that means that there's more women uh, in the system. So I was trying to think about policies that we could make to actually, uh, based on that, ah, that's probably not such a good idea. So again, on that slide, there's, there's not so much good news, even when you think that there would be, a, that there would be good news. Um, so that's the gender gap in participation. Now the gender gap in terms of scholarly output, what we see is that in almost all fields, there's a gap 
in the expected versus observed citation rates of scholars. So this is, of course, based on mean impact factor. It's far from being perfect, but it gives an indication of what could be expected in terms of citations uh, from female and male authors. So what you see in green, the little green, green line, is basically the male-female difference in impact factor. And you see that there's not really a big difference. In some fields, it's a bit below. So in some fields, it's a bit above. But then in terms of citations, there's always a gap in favor of men, irrespective of its for, whether it's first author or last author. So this is uh, akin to basically what we call the Matilda effect in science, where basically the, the less capital you have and the less capital you're going to get in the end. So this is a bit depressing. Now we wanted to say, OK, do we actually see a similar gap in open access? Do we see that women deposit less uh, in OA than, than men, or it's the opposite? And in that case, it's relatively good news. Now we need to find the reasons why. Um, so there's more OA when the lead author is female, which may be for plenty of good reason, that one of them being that women are more likely to care than than male. Um, and this thing is actually observed in every country. Um, so be it the US, China, Canada, UK, France, etc. cetera. Um, there's a few cases. The, the, the two little cases that, that were not the case are Spain and Russia. But this is a gender gap, I suppose, on which we can build on uh, to try to, let's say, um, level up, uh, all of us level up. But that, that's kind of very, very little. Uh, result which, which I find very interesting. And now th the last thing that I want to mention relates to that piece um, that got published in 2009. So it's one of the early studies of open access. And I've been, and now I, I consider myself to be guilty, but I've been guilty of presenting that. And I'm sure many of us have used that slide uh, in the past to, to, um, to basically advocate for the importance of OA. And, and so what this slide basically shows is that developing countries or countries from the south are actually much more likely to cite open, open access papers than countries from the north. And this totally makes sense. And this was a very compelling argument to me um, that, of course, they don't have access to journals because subscriptions are expensive. And so what they cite is what's available in open access. But this was done using very early um, open access information, and I say, oh, OK, I'm going to try to replicate that using the unpaywall data. And I did it about five times um, to realize in the end that, no, no, Vincent, you did not make a mistake. That's how the data looks like. And actually, the data looks totally the opposite of what that 2009 study shows. And even when you control for, of course, discipline. Because of course, if you are working a lot in chemistry, and chemistry literature is not open access, then of course you're more likely to cite less open access studies than if you work in other fields. So even when you control for discipline, what you actually see is that the North is citing much more OA than the South. That rich countries are actually citing much more OA in proportion than countries for, from the South. And I was totally puzzled as to why we observed that at the paper level with this, with this let's say, better, better data set. Um, and so I went to my lab, and there was two of my Chinese PhD students that were here about uh, an hour ago while I was finishing that. Um, that is not true. It was this morning, actually. <laughs> and so what, what Fei and Wei told me, they said, of course. We don't cite open access journals or open access papers. And, but it, they mostly said it at the level of open access journal, not at the level of papers. So you see that this is something more related to gold than to green. They said, we don't cite gold open access papers, gold open access journals, because they're considered to be of low quality. And given the importance of scientific capital and the importance of all of the salary bonuses that are associated with the prestige of publications, they actually try to go in the most mainstream as possible. If the journal could be printed on a papyrus, then this is what they would actually cite, you see? So the, it was really related to, to that. So why this difference? So, the, my first hypothesis was Sci-Hub, that in the end, given that it's used by pretty much everyone, that while it kind of changes the dynamics, um, what I just mentioned, the perception of quality of open access journals. Um, and Wei and Fei are both working on a piece that is actually very similar to what Erin presented yesterday with Juan Pablo on, the, on what are the policies for tenure and promotions in China. And you really see that in many cases, if there's an APC associated with a journal, it doesn't count. 
in many institutions, and we know that Chinese are publishing in plus all the time, but it still has a little stigma that's associated with it because of the APCs, because of the open access. So there's something that I believe we need to reflect on. And then other factors, of course, uh, changes in referencing practices maybe that we've seen over the last 10 years, and maybe country uh, self-citation. But this is, to me, a very puzzling. I think we have good hypothesis as to why this is happening. But again, we need to reflect about who's benefiting from open access. Are actually the right regions of the world uh, benefiting from that? So I'm going to conclude very quickly. Um, what we're seeing is that Funders have a very important role uh, in the creation of an open access culture. They control the incentives, they control the funding, um, and they actually also control the support for the common uh, and open infrastructure that we're, all, I believe, all trying uh, to create. And in some cases, it can actually work. So this is a very positive thing. Um, we also, I think, believe, uh, I believe we need to reflect on the presumption of importance of OE research. We all think that this is very good, but we might not be um, uh, there might be other opinions in the system, and quite some time by people were kind of trying to, 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 to help and to support. And last word, we need better open infrastructure for analyzing these things. Uh, most of the research that I presented was drawing on both an open data source and a closed data source, and I hope that the next time I'm going to be presenting that, it's going to be on two open data sources. So thank you very much. Are there any concerns? <laughs> Quite a few, that's good. Yep, yeah, yeah, sure, thanks. There was a question there. Have you also analyzed publishing uh, by developing countries in open access journals? Um, no, we didn't get there. Um, and this, is, this would be the, the next step to do kind of a sanity check. Um, I think that one of the things there, it, it does not drive everything, but it certainly has an effect. Each country self-cites its own research more than others. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, of course, if you publish less in OA venues, and you self-cite yourself more, then of course, that leads to lower global shares of references to open research. Um, but yeah, but this is something that is already available in the <coughs> Open Science Monitor. That was for John. That's <laughs> all. Oui. Oh, it's not gonna help. Okay. Um, thanks for those wonderful talks. Really oh, uh, hold the mic, Cameron. Closer? Yeah, okay. Oh dear. <laughs> It's really great to see this, this work coming out. Um, I just I wanted to um, partly answer the, that question. We've been doing very similar kinds of work, looking at the university level um, and looking at some developing universities, some developing countries. Um, and so I just wanted to really reinforce uh, the story about infrastructure. Because yeah, yeah. um, the one thing we see um, in that work um, is that Latin America is way out ahead. Um, on a completely different path to the rest of the world. Um, and it's really, it really does look like it's down to Cielo um, yeah, totally. and all the, the infrastructure development that was done there um, over many years. So, yeah. so just the, that, that there's many, and the other uh, success story is South Africa. Um, yeah. So a lot, of, um, a lot of open access from South Africa. Mm -hmm. And we did a rough comparison of South Ar Africa versus the Dutch. Um, and for a whole set of search terms, um, in web of science, um, South Africa had a higher percentage of open access articles for every one of those search terms we looked at. They're all disease based. So there's a lot, there's a lot of success stories. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. And, and the, the Cielo case, again, to reinforce your reinforcement, n none of that was actually included in, in the data because they're not being indexed in, in, in the web of science. It's kind of a separate database in, in the end. Um, and in their case, there are 100% open access. So, so again, there's not, the question of compliance does not even exist. You publish there, you're away, and that's it. And this is a collective infrastructure that they created. But why did, we need to go back as to why does it come from the South? It's a very simple reason, because of all, all of our good journals, all, all of our communities went to the for, with the for-profit publishers in the mid-1990s. So we basically gave out the control of our scholarly journals. And then all of the journals from the South, at first, they say, oh, we're left alone? Okay. 
we're going to find a solution. And now we actually should look at them and how they did it and rebuild our own collective scholarly infrastructure. I'm getting angry, just like. <laughs> uh, Vansar, that was a great talk. Thank you. Um, so, oh, I've completely forgotten my question. <laughs> <laughs> Just make um, a comment, then. Okay. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. It was about the, um, this weird thing, this uh, perception of OA as, as low quality in, yeah. in developing countries. And that's something that um, is, I've seen elsewhere. The cyber, um, the cyber group who do these uh, uh, interviews with uh, early career researchers, they find this quite uh, strongly. Yeah. But it's very weird because presumably, you, you know, the, the, the funders that have the best mandates are the, you know, the kind of high quality, the NIH, the kind of, you know, the ones who have these very high quality work. So, where, why, why is this happening? I don't understand what's, what's causing the perception. I think it's probably, one of it is probably due again to the high variability in the OA journal. So of course you have journals that are fully OA that are at the top of the top and then you've got quite a, if, let's say that you start a new journal, it's gonna be OA, I suppose in 95% of the time. And so of course, it's not so much the OA aspect than, than that the journal is being new or that it does not come from a mainstream publisher or, let's say, a core country. And so I think that this probably plays a role. And of course, it, get confl it gets conflated with OA because it's kind of their second characteristics. That would be my, my best case. There should be quite a, a few surveys to be done with academics from these countries or economists because actually they behave in a very similar manner. In, in econ, you publish in plus one. It's negative capital rather than positive capital. Yeah. Bonjour. Bonjour, Vincent. Uh, um, I have a question regarding the possibility that Shirk would adopt a mandate mm -hmm. to uh, force uh, Canadian uh, scholarly journals to deposit. But they have. They have. They have. But they, I mean, reinforce that that um, obligation. Um, what do you think that would be the impact on the viability of the Can Canadian uh, humanities and social sciences journals that are, as, as we know, uh, small mm -hmm. and uh, operating yeah. in a very small budget? OK, so th there's two things here. So most Canadian scholars in social sciences and humanities publish in journals other than Canadian ones. Um, they publish in American, British, uh, inter, in so-called international journals. Uh, in the case of, uh, let's say, our own Canadian journals, then of course there's always a question of support. It costs money to publish. It costs money to maintain the collective infrastructures. Um, and to be totally transparent, I'm the scientific director of, of IRUDI, which is a French, <laughs> French language and partly Canadian, let's say, um, dissemination platform. Um, a paper that is published in an IRUDI journal is de facto compliant with the Shirk policy. Uh, and so maintaining the same level of funding basically leads to, to full compliance. Of course, if we accept that the 12-month embargo is, is good, and that's what Shirk decided. Now, if they want to go without an embargo, it's, a, it's, another, it's another discussion. Yeah. Um, I would like to home in on this uh, question of, of whether OA is cited more from the global yeah. south yeah. or not, and uh, offer an um, alternative perspective. Yeah. Uh, which is the Wikimedia one. So you can look at the citations from Wikipedia as to research from and so on. And the data set actually exists. Um, and uh, so I've looked at Vietnamese in particular, and uh, their uh, OA usually trumps uh, the non-OA. Um, and so it is much more vis visible than in uh, the, in other languages, for instance, okay. English language or so. And so it doesn't correlate with country very much, but there are certain languages that mm -hmm. correlate with country, and so you can do uh, some sort of control experiment uh -huh. by looking at those citations. Yes, I want that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, two questions. One simple, uh, for, for the gender gap thing, yeah. did you control for a uh, scientific field at all? Because of course the gender disparities are very different from one field from to the other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is the general trend. What you said, the level of field was most of the field had the same trend. Then there were a few that were a bit, a bit less. What, what we need to add to that is a control for proportion of, pay. yeah, we need to control for that. But globally, the trend is the same when you look at by field. So if you break it down by chemistry, math, et cetera. Cool. And second, uh, what's your perception of why funders do not enforce their mandates? I mean, <laughs> like if, if I was a funder, it sounded simple, or just yeah. like take out the money. Why does it happen so infrequently and yeah, that's a, that's a good so question. soft? 
there was a, uh, on the, I think on the Gold Open Access list about five years ago, there was a journalist that was asking, so do you guys know of any scholar that actually lost its funding because it did not come, he or she did not comply? And silence radio, no one said anything. So it's as if that has never happened. Um, I believe one of the reasons is that the awards management in the end are not ma made by the research councils. They're made by the institutions that receive the money. So when I get a grant from the Canadian Research Council, it gets to my university, and then in the end, the university does the management of my, of my grant. And so my university has no time for that. They should take the time, but they don't necessarily consider it to be, to be important enough. And so those that have taken it seriously, in the, as in the case of NIH, is that you actually need to, in your annual report, provide them with the PubMed Central information. So you need to provide them with the ID, which means that if you have that ID for your paper, it's open access de facto, you see? So they have the resources to, to do it, and they took it seriously, and it's a very simple system in the end. It's built in the reporting system. In the case of the others, in the case of Shirk, for instance, not to continue hitting them, but there's no reporting service. So if you don't have a reporting system, then of course, um, compliance or monitoring of compliance is a bit more difficult. So we need to actually build those to make sure that, that it works. Build those openly. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, yeah. uh, you talked about funders and institutions and their policies. What role do you see in this uh, for scholarly societies? I see many roles for scholarly societies. One, one of them is to flip their journals. Um, so that the de facto would be compliant with that way. I agree with that. Um, and, then, and then they have an education role. And I, I think from the various societies I, I'm associated to, I think that there's a lot of work to be done about, they need to self-reflect about what they need to do with themselves. Because their role in general is changing, and their role in ed education, educating the new generation of scholars, as well as educating the older one that needs to be re-educated. Um, <laughs> would be something quite important. So again, from a both a, uh, both a content and, uh, yeah, and yeah, I'd say it's education and, and, and flipping the journals would be the best roles there, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, yeah, you guys. appreciate it.